Hello, and welcome to the Real American Revolution, a series of public television programming interviews with authors, historians, and scholars who focus on what really happened during the Our American Revolution. Now, my name is Randy Flood, and today's interview is brought to you by the Real American Revolution and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. My guest today is author and historian John Beeks. John graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1966 and served in nuclear submarines until 1974, when he began a business career of executive leadership in service technology companies. Now, John is a co-author, along with Jim Pikick, of Cool Deliberate Courage, John Eager Howard and the American Revolution, and also another book, Light Horse Harry Lee in the War for Independence. In 2015, John published Otho Holland Williams in the American Revolution, a military biography of another superb Revolutionary War soldier. And today, he'll be talking with us about his latest biography, DeKalb, one of the Revolutionary War's bravest generals. So John, welcome to the real American Revolution. So let's begin. John, what led you to write about Baron DeKalb? Not a lot of Americans know about him, but why did you write about him? As you said in your very kind introduction, Randy, um, I've written previously about the two superb Maryland officers, John Eager Howard and Otho Holland Williams, as I discovered untold stories of really fine combat leaders in the revolution. And after spending a few years studying them and writing their two books, in the background was this German-born uh, French officer, the Cow who commanded the Maryland line for two years prior to the Battle of Camden, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And DeKalb was a soldier of many years experience, very, very highly regarded in the French army, and had spent years uh, getting up every morning in a, in a camp, uh, making sure the guards were doing their duty properly, just attending to military duties every day, moving his troops 15 miles a day, setting up campsites at night, studying fortifications. He had led a soldier's life for his lifetime. When he came to America in 1777, he was 56 years old and a very distinguished officer, which we'll talk about. But anyway, uh, Williams and Howard both entered the Army with very little military experience. Uh, Otho Holland Williams was a clerk from Western Maryland. And uh, John Eager Howard was a farm boy just north of, of Baltimore at age 23, Williams 26. And within seven years, so they were green, they didn't have any training, you know, like today's officers get officer candidate school or mm -hmm. those kinds of things. They had none of that. They went right into the Army. And seven years later at Yorktown, the American Army was as good as any on earth. So it's a magnificent story of development. George Washington had a list of books that he wanted people to read and study, a, a, a British or German officer, a Hessian officer named Ewald, mentioned in his book that they had captured as many as 100 American officers over the years, and in their knapsacks were these books about military leadership. So they studied, they learned, they made mistakes, they learned from those, but there was another ingredient that I began to slowly realize, and of course, Baron von Steuben gets a lot of credit for Valley Forge, and he did uh, make a manual of arms and instill discipline and teach the army how to fight. But the cab arrived into the army just about the same time as um, Steuben at Valley Forge. And there's lots of evidence that in the, in the uh, units that Galb commanded, he brought a level of discipline and uh, military performance that was exceptional. And I really do believe that uh, Williams and, and uh, Howard learned a lot from the example and the daily work that the Cal did to instill military discipline in these troops. So really, it, it was kind of an experience of an extension of my work on Howard and Williams and, and the young officers of the Maryland line. But also, just as a side, it led me to uh, Europe. I didn't really understand much about the, uh, the wars in Europe in the 1740s and 1750s. And then to how France tried to support America as early as the 1760s and what they were involved with. So it led to be a fascinating story. And um, it, I'm glad I wrote it. And I think it, it puts a finishing uh, touch on this idea of how did young officers like uh, Williams and Howard develop into such fine leaders. 
Well, DeKalb came over here really with Lafayette on the same, same ship, but uh, where did he really come from? He, was, uh, he wasn't born in France, was he? No. DeKalb was German. He was born in Huttendorf, Germany. It's about uh, 10 miles northwest of uh, Nuremberg. And into a peasant family. That's very, very, very important in my understanding of his life story. He was born into a peasant home. He was a farm boy. He was a very big man. He was the only officer, only general officer in the American army that could compare in size and strength with George Washington. They looked you know, like uh, twins almost in terms of size and strength. But anyway, he was born in uh, Huttendorf, Germany. At age 20, he got picked up into the French army and he served uh, in the Chasseurs, the first partisan units in uh, Europe. But then he was uh, brought into a, uh, a very unique and very distinguished regiment of the French army under a leader named Lowendahl, who was in the army of a leader named Saxe. So from about 1742 to 1750, DeKalb was in the army every day. He was in 20 major combats during seven years. So the ages of 21 to 28, his tutelage in, in, the, in the army was a daily involvement in the finest army in France under uh, Marshal Saxe, and in a lot of combat. So he learned about how you move armies, how you station artillery, how you do fortifications. He really had a tremendous training ground under one of the, Frederick the Great had dinner one evening with Saxe, and he stayed up all night. Frederick the Great was known for going to bed early every night. He stayed up all night because he said Saxe is absolutely the instructor of all generals in Europe. So DeKalb started there, and then he went to um, uh, an army in, in the Seven Years' War, our French and Indian War, where he uh, served under the Marshal de Broglie, which was important in his career because uh, de Broglie was a, a, a famous duke. Uh, he was well-connected with the king and all that, and all of a sudden, de Calb now had access to the highest reaches of French society. So he was from... Uh, Huttendorf, Germany. He was drafted into the French army and he spent his career in the French army. Mm -hmm. He was, it helped his career a lot and we'll talk about that. And he was fluent in English and French and German, which was a big help to him and a lot of the work that he would subsequently have. Well, he also uh, got to know Lafayette and he, when he came over across the ship, didn't he, didn't he assist Lafayette in learning English? Absolutely. He said on the ship over here, uh, part of his job was to tutor Lafayette in English. And he had broken English by the time Lafayette met with, with Washington for the Battle of Brandywine. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, in terms of uh, leading up to Lafayette, Lafayette was 19 at the time he came over in 1777, and DeKalb was 56. There's one biographer of DeKalb named A.E. Zucker wrote a biography through the University of North Carolina. He titled it Lafayette's Mentor, DeKalb Lafayette's Mentor. I believe both Lafayette and DeKalb would not have agreed with that title. He, uh, he was here to help mentor uh, Lafayette, of course, but Lafayette was the wealthiest man in France. He essentially owned most of Southern France. The ship they came on, Lafayette bought, uh, and you know he had a lot of difficulty getting permission from the French king and the nobility to come to America. And DeKalb was involved in all that. But um, they were uh, friends. Um, we'll talk about it later, I guess. But, you know, Lafayette uh, spoke at his, uh, when he came to America in 1824, 25, he spoke at, at the DeKalb's tomb, mentioned him as a great friend. And um, so, yeah, they, they, uh, they came together. They marched from, they spent a week in Charleston, South Carolina together, very interesting. And then they got up to Philadelphia and uh, basically I got in the American army roughly the same time. Well, let's talk about DeKalb's involvement with the American uh, War for Independence. Uh, what was his major contribution or what were his major contributions uh, to the effort? Well, you know, one thing I want to mention, Randy, to be sure that, that uh, people understand, DeKalb, as he rose through the army, uh, he, he was a lieutenant colonel and quartermaster general of, of one of the French armies uh, at the end of the Seven Years' War. And um, he, um, he married a very, very wealthy woman. There was a lot of that in France in those days that the distinguished soldiers were uh, betrothed to wealthy women. 
And uh, so he, he saved a lot of money himself as quartermaster general. He got a, a commission on things that were bought for the army. But then by marrying into the Robay family, R-O-B-A-I-S, he became an extremely wealthy person. He had a chateau near Versailles. He had a very elegant townhouse in Paris. And he, he was a man of significant wealth. Now, coming over here, the French spent a lot of years. In fact, in the 1760s, Cacao came on a secret mission to America for the French king. The French were had been pretty well beaten in the Seven Years' War and had lost a lot. They lost Canada, for example, India. And um, they won a move against them. So they wanted to know what's going on in America. So DeKalb went to America 1767-768, uh, 10 years before the revolution, or nine years. And he came over as a, uh, basically as a spy. He came to Philadelphia, went to New York, went to Boston, went to um, Nova Scotia, and then back to France. Collected a lot of information about America, made some very prescient observations, said this country will be free eventually. The spirit of independence is very strong among these people. He couldn't believe the level of enterprise when you went to the American ports. They were just filled with ships who were moving back and forth. There's energy everywhere. So he had a really good understanding, and he studied uh, fortifications everywhere when I mentioned he and Lafayette came to uh, Charleston typical of him he took a day with Moultrie and went out to um, Fort Moultrie at, at Charleston and reviewed the fortifications there and wrote a letter back to the Duke de Broglie uh, uh, observing what the fortifications were like so the point is he, he, he was fluent in English big help and he had a good knowledge of America and France was trying to figure out how to support this revolution. And uh, they wanted the cow, they wanted Lafayette to go. That, that was important. And Lafayette wanted to go. He was committed to the ideals of the revolution. Mm -hmm. But he was 19, he was militarily inexperienced and all that. So they set up a system whereby uh, the cow came to America with, with Lafayette. Silas Dean was the only American representative in Europe at the time, and he worked through all. There's a lot of intrigue to getting Lafayette to be able to come. But the point I want to make is, is that in preparing for DeKalb to come, the French king did two things. He had retired as a lieutenant colonel. They made him a brigadier general, and they called it of the colony. So it was, it was a lower rank than of the French army itself, but he was a brigadier general of the colonies. He wanted to be a general. And they made him a baron. Many writers about DeKalb have said he was a self-styled styled baron, and that is not true. He was a baron. There's a letter written by the Secretary of War, the Minister of War, to DeKalb, talking about him going to America, giving him a two-year leave of absence, and it's addressed to Baron DeKalb. Lafayette called him Baron DeKalb. Washington called him Baron DeKalb. The French King called him Baron DeKalb. He was a baron, not by birth, not by birth, but as a reward for undertaking the mission of going to America to help Lafayette and others uh, serve in the American War. So as I mentioned, they got to uh, Charleston in, uh, I think, June 1777. They, they uh, spent a week there and were feted and all that. Everybody was very impressed that Lafayette had bought the ship. And uh, he uh, in, left money for Moultrie to have a, a arm 100 cavalrymen and all that kind of a thing. So it was a, and he was a mason and uh, Lafayette was a mason, Moultrie was a mason. Many were, and that, that, that connection seemed to help the connection between the Americans and the, uh, the, the French officers. Mm -hmm. um, so they got to, to Philadelphia and were very, very distressed uh, when Congress basically rejected them. They didn't even let them in. They, they, they had talked to them in the street, a congressman named Lovell, who was fluent in French. Didn't even let them come into the house of the, of the Congress to, to talk about things. And Lovell just dressed them down in the streets. And what had happened is there had French officers come earlier, a guy named Du Cordray, who was an artillerist that had demanded uh, obedience and was very arrogant and really left a lot of people with a bad taste in their mouth about French officers. And plus, there was, they all sensed an anti French feeling among the Americans, uh, a lot of it from the French and Indian War. And DeKalb actually mentioned that Washington had sort of an anti-French feeling. And he was sure that that came from the French and Indian War and then Washington's time on the frontier. 
So uh, Lafayette, with his charm, his wealth, and his agreement to serve without pay and serve without a command, uh, won Congress over and then won Washington over. And of course, we all know Washington almost had almost a father-son relationship with Lafayette. They became enormously mm -hmm. fond of each other. But leaving Philadelphia, they told uh, Lafayette, you can go. And he went and participated in a battle of Brandy, Brandywine, September 11th, 1777. But the cow was told to return to France. So he wanted to see the Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And he went up to Bethlehem and was reviewing the fortifications there and so forth. And Congress ran after him. They figured out eventually that he had some capabilities. So he finally decided, OK, I'll accept a, a major general's commission as long as Washington agrees to it. And I won't take a command unless Washington himself feels I should. I don't want to demand that. So a very interesting to me story. He comes back from Bethlehem to Philadelphia. He goes to the army. This is before, uh, after Germantown, but before Valley Forge. And Washington's very concerned about the forts in the Delaware River. He wants to stop supplies from coming up the Delaware River to Philadelphia so the British won't be able to feed their army during the winter. So those forts were very important, having lost Brandywine in Germantown and the British are, are uh, in Philadelphia. So he sent Knox, his trusted friend, Sinclair, uh, who he'd known a long time, and DeKalb on a mission. I want you to review those forts in the river, and I want you to uh, tell me what we should do to, to preserve them. Are they gonna be able to be saved? Do we need to reinforce? What do we need to do? So they spent two days reviewing those forts south of Philadelphia and came back. And you got to remember that there was a lot of questioning about these French officers and, you know, are they really going to be able to help us and that kind of a thing. And I, nothing is written down on this. This is just facts. Two days after that report, the cab was given command of a division. Now, what I believe is very likely that, you know, Knox and Sinclair said, hey, General, General Washington. This man knows what he's talking about. He had studied fortifications his whole life. He did it at Charleston. He did it. At, he set up the fortifications in Bethlehem. So anyway, and I think this is between the lines also. I can't put my hand on anything that says it, except maybe when Washington wrote about him after the Calf's death. But I think they had a pretty good bond. I think Washington respected him. So for the next two years, in fact, well, DeKalb wintered at, at, the, at Valley Forge. Uh, there was a short time there where uh, Gates was trying to get uh, Lafayette's influence with, with Washington was obviously powerful. And so some people think Gates was threatened by that. So they came up with this idea that they'd invade Canada with uh, Lafayette in command. And uh, DeKalb was given uh, the assistant in command. So you got a 19-year-old Major General and his deputy is a 56-year-old highly decorated soldier to Cal. But anyway, nothing ever came of that, but it's interesting that they, they served together. So really for the next two years, the Cal um, was part of Washington's army. One of the things I think is important in the book, I, I laid out where he was every one of the two years between 70, 78, 1778 and 1780. And when you look at it, it's really an arc around New York City. That's what Washington and the Army were doing. There was a little bit of a activity at Stony Point. Some of the Cal's officers were involved, but he wasn't. But they, they had to defend West Point because that protected the crossing of the Hudson River. They had to worry about the, the British leaving Boston and going to New York and going to Boston or Rhode Island. They had to worry about them coming down to Philadelphia. They had to worry about, about them going up the West Point. So for two years, they were constantly on alert. Every time the British moved, and he couldn't tell where they were going. If they 100 ships went somewhere, where are they going? Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, you know, a time of tension. But those are the two years in which every morning, the Maryland line got up and their commander was the cow. And I know they had a disciplined uh, military uh, existence every day under his leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, the guards were attentive, the officers went and checked the guards, all those kinds of things that would go with proper military leadership. Sure, sure. Well, how is DeKalb remembered today? What made him so unique? Uh, and can you maybe describe some of the, the uh, tributes and memorials 
to his memory around the country? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is that his, his moment of glory in America was at the Battle of Camden, August the 16th, 1780 in Camden, South Carolina. And he had, Washington had chosen him to lead the Maryland Line South, uh, 725 miles, you know, again, I think about this, you know, it, they didn't uh, load up the station wagon and put, uh, you know, food in, in the trunk. They marched 10, 15 miles a day for 700 and some miles. And uh, so again, that, that's a tremendous uh, act of military performance in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Gates relieved him when they got down there. Uh, he was not particularly adept at independent command. I think he was collegial. He liked being part of an army. He liked being, and like many uh, military leaders, you know, uh, Richard Yule, for example, was fantastic when he served under Stonewall Jackson. He was a magnificent subordinate. But the first night of uh, Gettysburg, uh, he, he was given the assignment to take Culp's Hill. And just the responsibility, I think, overwhelmed him. The Cal, I think, was kind of like that. As long as he was part of the team, he was great. But he had sole responsibility, especially as a German and French officer in America, uh, communicating with the American governors and all that. I think it, he was very happy that Gates came. Three weeks after Gates took command, they had the Battle of Camden. And people probably know the story of that, but basically it was the Maryland line under the cab on the right, militia in the center and the left, and very quickly the militia fled in front of the, uh, the British uh, bayonet attack. And DeKalb and his command were surrounded. Fortunately, people like Howard and Williams figured a way to get away through the swamps. But DeKalb stood and fought. He stood and fought as he had been trained to do his whole life, as British generals or uh, European generals did, the French generals did. He had been at the Battle of Fontenoy where Marshal Saxe went right to the front line and saved the army. So DeKalb's heroic stand at Camden was something people never forgot. Um, you know, uh, many, many people talked about that. Washington talked about it. He, he had 11 wounds. He was three bullet wounds and 11 uh, cuts from sabers and, and bayonets that day. He bled to death three days later in the town of Camden. And as word of that went north, everyone recognized that this was a, a very, very brave man. Uh, Guilford Dudley, who was at the battle, said that the cow was covered with wounds and glory. Uh, many people have written about him, talked about that unbelievable, nobody who ever saw him fight that day ever forgot it. Mm -hmm. Washington visited his grave uh, when he did his uh, tour as President of the United States. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, Lafayette laid the tombstone actually at the Presbyterian Church in Camden, South Carolina when he visited in 1824. So there's the Presbyterian Church in Camden, uh, the 250th uh, celebration of the revolution. There's going to be a statue of DeKalb uh, placed in Camden. Uh, there is a statue at the Maryland State House, which is wonderful. Yeah, it shows him in a heroic pose, leading his troops forward. Mm -hmm. And um, that's on the, the grounds of the State House, mm -hmm. at the Capitol. There are about half a dozen counties. Atlanta is in DeKalb County. There's a DeKalb County in Illinois, one in Missouri, one in Indiana, uh, a number of those around. But the simple truth is, is that I think that for a lot of reasons, DeKalb is basically uh, not remembered very much at all. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book. Mm -hmm. This is a man who had uh, tremendous wealth. He had everything he needed in France. He was retired from the French army. He owned a wonderful palatial townhouse in, uh, in Paris. He had a magnificent chateau near uh, Versailles. He was revered and honored as a, as a uh, decorated uh, soldier from, uh, from the French army. He had everything he needed, yet he, he left all that and came to America. He went through the winter at Valley Forge. He was in camp and on the march every day around New York. He led the army south and he gave his life fighting for us. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, the book and, and things like this that you're doing, Randy, will have people at least remember a little bit about this wonderful man who came here and gave his life uh, in, in the fight for our independence. Mm -hmm. Well, you, I think you've just answered my last question. I was gonna ask you, what's your major takeaway from this book? You know, what's the one thing that uh, Americans who read this uh, biography of DeKalb, 
really need to remember about him? And it really, I think you really answered it. You know, I, I believe that's right. I, I, you know, I think I finished the book with, um, was a man of great wealth, tremendous military experience, a, a leader's leader. Uh, he left a lot in, in the performance after Camden of the, the Maryland line. You can just see the discipline there. You can see the, the training of, of, of everyday uh, discipline under DeKalb. Mm-hmm. And he gave his life fighting for us. And in my view, we should remember him. That's really pretty, pretty extraordinary. And he's an extraordinary individual. So, well, John, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about Baron de Kalb and the American Revolution. It's been a real pleasure to have you on The Real American Revolution. And uh, folks, this is the book. I'm going to hold it up here. De Kalb, one of the Revolutionary War's bravest generals. Right there it is. Tremendous book, and it's available on Amazon as well as publishers in general. Published and available at Heritage Books, by the way, at heritage.com, heritagebooks.com. So there it is, DeKalb, one of the Revolutionary War's bravest generals. Excellent book. So join us again. Thank you again, John, and join us again for another exciting presentation about the real American Revolution, what really happened uh, during our war for independence. My name is Randy Flood, and so long for now.